right. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word or your phone, however you want to get there, get to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we're in week six, halfway finished. Guys, I can't believe it. We're all halfway done uh, with the book of 1 Timothy. So uh, there's this gentleman by the name of Timothy Dwight. Timothy Dwight uh, lived in the 1800s and was really uh, said to be one of the greatest educators in American history. Uh, he took the presidency of Yale University and he turned that place around. Uh, it was really not a great place. And under his leadership, he doubled enrollment. Uh, he changed the way that they taught curriculum uh, and he changed the administration. I mean, this guy just dominated in leadership uh, at Yale University. As a matter of fact, he got two honorary degrees, one from Princeton and another one from another Ivy League school uh, from Harvard, just because of his leadership ability uh, and what he was able to do on this campus. So he was a loved educator, but more than this, what he was known for really was his love for the church and the preaching of God's word. Uh, many of you don't, might not know this, but most of our Ivy League schools started as centers for training pastors. They were Christian schools, theological schools. And so here's Dwight literally preaching God's word and his really his greatest ministry, his greatest leadership moment in his life was when he preached in, I can't remember the year, I got to look at my notes, I can't remember it on my top of my head here, in 1802. 1802, a long time ago, his greatest achievement was when he was preaching that year in school and a third of his students were converted to Christianity. A third of the student body was saved by the power of the gospel. Uh, this man, he loved education, but more than that, he loved Jesus. And maybe uh, a close second to that was he really, really loved God's church. He loved God's church. As a matter of fact, in uh, 1800, he wrote a famous song, old school language. They called them hymns. Uh, he wrote this song called, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. Listen to these lyrics. They're up on the screen for you. He said, for her, my tears shall fall. For her, my prayers ascend. To her, my cares and toils be given till toils and cares shall end. His heart burned for the church. It's what uh, kept him up at night. It's what uh, uh, stirred his emotions that would cause the tears to fall down from his eyes onto his cheeks. Uh, this was a man who loved the church. These words could have really just been written by the Apostle Paul. Paul had this burning passion and desire for God's church. It was his greatest joy, but it was also some of his greatest pain. Said every pastor in the world that, that loves the church, that gives his life to the church. It can be some of your greatest joy, but it can be some of the greatest struggle as well. And the apostle Paul in the book of Acts, we learn when he left the church at Ephesus, I mean, he cried like he was on his face with the local elders of that church and he didn't want to leave, but God was compelling him to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. He loved this place. And what we learn in 1 Timothy chapter 3 we're going to learn from the, uh, from the pages of scripture, but more than that, from Paul's heart, how to fight the good fight of the faith for a strong foundation. You see, the foundations matter in churches. Foundations matter in your life. Foundations matter in your home. And uh, the uh, psalmist tells us in Psalm 11 that uh, if the foundation crumbles, what will the righteous do? If the foundation of the church begins to crumble, what, what are we going to do as people? And the Apostle Paul uh, was uh, ministering from a distance through the local elder Timothy, through that local pastor. And he's like, listen, don't let the foundation crumble because when it does, man, it's going to be painful for everybody. So fight the good fight and build a strong and firm foundation so that your church will last forever. So in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 14. Why don't you stand with me as we honor God through the reading of his word. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 14, if you're there, say amen. amen. All right, here we go. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He 
was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. This is God's word for God's people today on his day. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and grab your seat. The Apostle Paul lays down, really, I'm organizing it in two main points. Okay, point number one is this. It is the message delivered. The message delivered. Paul's got a message that he's delivering to this particular church, uh, and he's got this desire. Paul has this longing birthed within him. Look in verse 14. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things. I'm writing these things so that, and then he goes on into verse 15. But I really like how the New Living Translation really interprets this verse because you get the angst in Paul. You get the burning passion. You get the longing that Paul has. And it says this, I'm writing these things to you now in this particular moment, even though I hope to come to you soon. Paul's got this desire to be in Ephesus because this church has literally gone off the rails. He loves Timothy. It's the son that he never had. It's the son in the faith. And he's raised him up to lead this local church. But Paul wants to be there. And for some reason, this urgent desire to be there uh, has uh, actually not come to fruition. Uh, The reality was, is after Paul was released from the uh, first imprisonment uh, that he experienced by the Romans, you can read about it in Acts 28, uh, he went to go visit several cities. And one of those main cities was this place called Ephesus. And he wanted to visit Timothy there. And uh, as he was there, he was connecting with them, but then he left and he went on into Macedonia. And when he left Ephesus, there's no doubt in our minds uh, throughout history that Paul was there and then he was gone. And what's interesting is, is as he left um, Ephesus and he went to another place, the reality was, was that Ephesus never left his heart and ever left, never left his mind. Have you ever heard that, like, uh, you can take the southern out of the boy, but you can't, wait, you can take the boy out of the south, but you can't take the south out of the boy, stuff like that? Like, that's the same mindset, is that you can take Paul out of Ephesus, but Ephesus never gets off his mind and off of his heart, and he wanted desperately to be back there with them. What does this have to do with you and me today? Well, what I think we learn from the Apostle Paul in this particular moment is this longing and desire to be with God's people. Paul had this longing and desire to be with the people of God in Ephesus. And the question is, is do you long to be with God's people? Do you long to be connected into a group of people where you are known by those people? And they know you. You see, so much of what happens today in our life is we we, we engage with church on a screen. We engage with our discipleship to Jesus by YouTube clips from pastors that don't know us and will never know us because they live in another city. And the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, I'm in another place and I'm writing to you, but the truth is I want to be bodily present with you. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because when God's people show up on God's day, in God's house, sitting under the authority of God's word, God's presence comes in a unique way that is different when you're viewing him being preached about on a screen. There's nothing wrong if you're watching on a screen today. We love that. We want these sermons and our church and what God's doing here to get legs and go further and faster than we could ever take it. But it doesn't replace the bodily gathering of God's people because God moves differently in this room physically when you're here than when you go back and watch it on a Tuesday. And how many of you can testify to that, that you're serving back there, you're serving in other places, and then you're like, man, I heard church was awesome, but it wasn't the same for me because I watched it or I listened to it on the drive to work four times because that's how long my pastor preaches. (laughs) Right? Like it's just different because God's manifest presence happens in a unique moment in time where he shows up in power. And the Apostle Paul's teaching us to long for his presence in the church of Jesus Christ. I remember this like it was yesterday, but it was many, many, many months ago. Many, many months ago, there was a person who I'd been working on, Joy and I'd been working on for a long time to get back into church. Back into church. We watch online. We're back into church. Watch online. Blah, 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 blah. Life had just taken a toll on their family. 
And then they showed back up. And I'll never forget what they said. This, I, I did not understand how much I missed the church. How much I needed this place. Because you want to know, well, let me say it this way. Do you want to know why you feel that way? Because this is the dearest place on earth. This is the place where you find the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is where you find fulfillment, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. This is where you find the satisfying little element of every single longing that your heart has found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This is the dearest place on earth and you, fa- earth and you found it. And the sad part of the reality is, is that so many of us choose church. What do you mean by that? We choose church like we're going to a Chinese buffet. So I want a little Mongolian beef today. I want some broccoli and beef today. I want some egg rolls today. Well, I don't want Chinese food today. Today I want barbecue. So if you pick and choose when you engage in church and not engage in church, you're missing the dearest place on earth. This is the most important thing that we do is the gathering of the local church. This is what will stand the test of time. Things will come and go, but the gathering is a priority. And Paul says, I long to be there with you because there's no substitute. There's no substitute for this. I long to be with you. Why is that important? Because Paul knows that there's power living in community. There's power living in community. Now let's pull up the text and let's go there and I'll show this to you. He says this, he says that if I delay, verse 15, if I delay, you may know, it's this idea of confidence, how one or everyone ought to behave in the household of God. Better translation would be house of God. So what the apostle Paul is saying is is that, listen, I want to be with you. I have a desire to be with you. This is what I want for you. I want to be in this community together. But if I'm delayed, apparently there's some delay. We don't know what's delaying him. We don't even need to argue about it. It's just he's delayed, but he wants to be there. That's the point. And so what I'm doing in that delay, in that space between where I want to be and where I'm not, (laughs) uh, I'm writing to you. And some things I'm giving to you, I'm teaching you how you ought to obey when you gather as God's family in God's house. There's some things you need to know. Paul says in verse 14, these things. You should circle that in verse 14 in your Bible. There are certain things that Paul wants you to learn about how to live in God's house with God's family. There's specific things like what? Like the good fight for good doctrine. He's already talked about it. He wants you to fight and contend for the faith of many. Pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of people so that all kinds of opportunity could be opened up. He he wants you to contend for the right assignments, right? Like God has roles in the church and there are certain roles for certain people and that's just the way that God designed it. Uh, God wants you to fight for qualified leaders because when you have unqualified leaders, then your church gets off the rails in a nanosecond. He's gonna talk about later in the book of 1 Timothy, a fight over basically materialism. Like you need to learn how to be content with what you have, that God's more than enough for you. And there's other things that he's just gonna list out. And so there's no doubt in our minds that when Paul says, hey, I'm writing these things to you so that you should know how you ought to behave in the church of Jesus Christ, he's saying, I'm gonna tell, I've already told you some things, I'm gonna tell you some other things, but you know what else I think he's saying? He goes, I've already written some other books. I know you've probably read those. So there are some other things as well that I think you should apply when you are living in the context of community. What are those other things? It's the one another's of scripture. We'll throw them on the screen for you. It's the, the, the length of them is insane. We ought to love one another, John 13. We ought to honor one another, Romans 12. We ought to build one another up, Romans 14. We ought to admonish one another, Romans 15. We should care for one another, 1 Corinthians 12. We should serve one another, 
Galatians 5. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6. Forgive one another, Ephesians 4. We ought to teach one another, disciple one another, Colossians 3. We should comfort one another, 1 Thessalonians 4. Encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 5. And pray for one another, Ephesians 5. There's all these one another's in the scriptures that Paul, I think, has in mind. He goes, hey, you want to learn how to thrive in the power of community is when you're practicing the one another's of the faith. When you get your mind off of your own self and you start looking outwards and looking at people, seeing the whites of their eyeballs and knowing their struggles and living in real life with them and you practice those things, Jesus then throws weight onto why that stuff matters. What does he do? John 13, 35, by this, by what? By this, by your actions, by the tangible love that believers have for one another, all people will know, they will experience, they will come to the knowledge of the truth that you are my disciples. By the way that the church lives, by the way that the church loves, by the way that the church walks in the spirit, he's saying, by this, they will know that you're my church. They will know that you're, <laughs> they will know that you're my disciples. They will know that you're a part of the house of God. They will know that I live in that house. And that is the tangible difference between all other homes in a city. I'm there with them. It's the same thing Jesus said in Matthew 5. Matthew 5, he says, you are the light of the world. That's what you are. And then he says, let your light shine before others so that they, the world, may see, may see your good deeds. They may see the actions of your life. And what are they gonna do when they see it? They're gonna give glory to your father who is in heaven. You know what Jesus is really pointing us towards is this idea. If you want to jot this down, you can. The way we act will distract or attract people to God's family, the church. So the way that you and I act towards one another, guess what it does? It's either like a repellent or it's like a magnet. We either repel people to the, to the gospel because like what happens is, is when we repel people, we're probably not living out the gospel in our relationships with people. We're not living out the one another's of the scripture. We're selfish, we're egocentric, we're prideful, we're arrogant. But when we live in service to our king and to our brothers and sisters in God's church, Jesus is telling us that there's power in that. Paul is affirming there's power in that community. So many churches lack the power of God because they don't apply the truth of God in the context of their church. There's power when we practice these things. He also points out this, that uh, we have some concrete beliefs. So you've got certain behaviors that are powerful, but then we've got certain beliefs, concrete beliefs, that are powerful. Notice what he says. He says that the, the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and the buttress of truth. Can I just say this? this is, I'm teeing you up for a good spot for an amen, okay? Jim, I know you haven't been here in a while, so this is a good spot for an amen, amen for you. I know you've been out of town. We love you. The God of the true church is alive. The God of the true church is alive. Now that's important to say because there are gatherings all over the world that are in Christian by name only, but not in practice. And God's not alive in those churches, but God is alive in the true church. I was blown away this week when I read this recent article by Christianity Today. The researchers said that um, before the pandemic, 75% of Americans reported attending religious services at least once a month. Which if we're being honest, that's probably not even totally accurate. Like going to church once a month is not really going to church. That's like saying I shower once a week. That's not really meaning you're clean. 
You know what I mean? Like you get the comparison there, like just because you say you do something once a month doesn't make you something, right? Even if you've been here every single week since the last time you could, I even don't remember the last time, just because you show up doesn't even mean that you're a Christian. You've got to embrace the beliefs and the embrace of the beliefs is what makes you Christian and then you desire to be a part of the power of the community of Jesus Christ. So then they go on to say, by the spring of 2022, that figure dropped to 68%. 68% of people now say, I go to church maybe once a month. The data is actually probably even crazier than that, if we're being honest, depending on what city you're in, most likely. Why do I even say that? Well, because the data is telling us that people aren't coming. People aren't re-engaging into church. We've had that conversation uh, post the pandemic all the time. When are people gonna re-engage? But you wanna know something interesting? Do you wanna know what I see in our church? The opposite of that? Like I see the opposite of that data. Some of you don't even know this because you haven't been around long enough to know. Um, But the truth is, is that when we uh, were opened up after everybody opened up, there was a total of less, little less than 70 people in our entire building. And I think a couple of weeks ago, we almost had 70 kids in our church. You, you, if you're going to clap, you can't golf clap. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what we're seeing in this is that it's the opposite of this. The, we're, we're the flip-flop of this. What we see is we, we've now seen in the last several years more leaders trained. We've seen the church mobilized in local outreaches more than we did before the pandemic was even open before we, were, we closed down. We have seen men step up in leadership roles that I've never seen before. In any really church I've seen, like we've seen this, uh, this grassroots level desire that is birthed within you that is burning hot for the word of God. We're seeing people reorient their schedules to make sure that they're here, not so that they miss. People have come to this place sick, like Michael Jordan finals flu kind of sick, right? And they've showed up, sorry, I know, it's like, oh, you can't say that anymore. You can say whatever you want. You can say whatever you want, okay? But we've seen people show back up to God's church that have been fired up about what God's doing here. So some would say, well, why didn't those people return? Probably because God wasn't alive in those churches. And God is absolutely alive in this place. God is training, God is raising up, God is, uh, God is empowering, God is discipling, God is baptized through us, he's saved people. He's growing his church in a unique way. And how is he doing it? You know what God's been doing here is God has been taking care of the depth and then, we, well, that's our job. We're t- taking these roots deep, the scripture teaches us, and we're planting you by the living waters of the word of God, the psalmist tells us. You plant trees by living water and you do that then those roots grow deep down into the soil of God's word. And guess what happens? It springs forth fruit. And when it means fruit, what does that mean? It means it springs forth obedience in your heart, a desire for godliness, a desire for community, a desire to see other people who don't have what you have in Jesus so that they can have it. So it births this pattern of evangelism and sharing and, and opening up with, about your life to other people. So when that begins to happen, you begin to see, man, God's actually here. God's actually alive. And I know the world says God's dead, but God isn't dead. He is very alive. And the testimony of his aliveness is through you. God is very much alive in the true church. And he is absolutely building something here. And so you can read the data like I've read, or you can see weird posts wherever you see weird posts. But the truth is God's alive. He's alive. And somebody, you need to stoke the heart of your, the fire of your faith today. And maybe you feel like God's been dead to you. He's not dead to you. He's very aware. He's very aware of what's going on in your life. If you would just relent and not run, stop rebelling and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you know what will happen? You'll begin to hear him like you've never heard before. The God of the true church is alive. The God of the true church also, listen to this, the true church is built upon the truth. Notice what he says in verse 15, a pillar and buttress of the truth. A pillar 
and buttress of the truth. Now, this would have stuck out like a sore thumb to these guys. Because in Ephesus, there was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And it was the temple of Artemis. Here's a picture of what this looks like, or the temple of Diana, depending on your persuasion and background. But essentially, this was a massive building project that took over 120 years to build. It was, uh, look at the, 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 the foundation was massive. And these pillars were 127 pillars uh, stood uh, in support of the roof line. And all of those pillars were marble, gold-plated pillars. I mean, this thing was just a shining beacon of opulence in Ephesus. And as soon as Paul said a pillar and a buttress of truth, this is what they would have gone to. They would have been like, oh my gosh, we know exactly what you're talking about because pillar and buttress really just means foundation. There is a support and a foundation. And what's interesting is this took 120 years to build in one night to destroy by a local arsonist in Ephesus. Then many years later, they rebuilt this temple smaller scale, and it was destroyed again by the invasion of the Goths. Then many years after that, it was rebuilt again and finally destroyed for the last time around Constantine's death. So here we have this moment where what you're seeing, and Paul is using this language, get into their world, and he's saying, hey, the thing you've seen in your city that took forever to build, and you know the story, and you've seen those 127 pillars, you've seen that giant foundation, maybe you've walked up to tour inside of that when it was there, and you thought, man, this is immovable, unshakable, never gonna go anywhere. Today, that place lies in ruins in Ephesus. And he says, you wanna know what'll last forever? You wanna know what's unshakable? You wanna know what's immovable? Do you want to know what has stood every single generation of testing, of fire, of persecution, of trying to tamp down the church of Jesus Christ? He said the church of Jesus Christ is the living word. Like, hold on. It is the church of the living God. It ain't going anywhere. And no matter what generation tries to slow it down, tries to stop its message, it is built upon the truth of Jesus Christ. That's the only way it survives. It's the only way it survives. It's the pillar and the buttress of truth. Paul said in Ephesians 2.20, together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. It's Jesus. This thing that we're doing right now is built not upon a personality, a skill set, it is built upon one man and one man alone, and it's not me. It's Jesus Christ. He is our cornerstone. He is the one that we have built on. He is the one that we have uh, literally put on front street so that you could just see him. And get out. Of, I'll get out of the way. Any preacher that stood up here, our goal is to get out of the way so that you could see Jesus. Because he, as the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, he's the one that will change you. He's the one that will satisfy you. He's the one that will forgive you. He's the one that will do, he's the one who will fulfill every longing your heart has. Jesus will, the cornerstone, the one you build your life on. The sad reality is, is most churches build their lives and the life of the church on appetites. So many churches build their their ministry model off of an appetite of the customer being you. And so whatever the customer wants, well, that's what we got to give them. And so we've got to give TED Talk sermons. Got to have the best coffee in town. Got to have the best environment, which I'm all for good coffee and a good environment. Everything's got to be pleasing so that we tee up this really appetizing sermon, air quotes, so that you'll be inspired and motivated. The problem with appetites is that everybody's appetite is different. Everybody's appetite is different. Some of you are vegan. I don't know why, but you are. It's okay. Plenty of room at the foot of the cross for you. Some of you are 
carnivores. Some of you have tastes for traditional music. Some of you have tastes for contemporary music. Some of you have preferences that are, you like the NIV Bible, and I don't preach out of the NIV Bible. Some of you have a preference on style. The truth is, is if you build a church based off of preference, guess what you have? Lean in for just a second. You have a fragile church. Fragile. Why? Because preferences, styles, trends, and what's popular changes with the wind. It will be here today and gone tomorrow. Paul's saying, hey, you want a church that lasts? Hey, why don't you just build your entire model off of the timeless, but always timely and relevant truth of God's word? You do that, and guess what will happen? Every unique little appetite will find its way to the truth of Jesus Christ. And I don't have to worry about you finding your way because I actually believe in a sovereign God who woos your heart to to him anyway. Like, well, I found God. You didn't find God. God's not lost. You're lost. I'm lost. We're lost. And God finds us. And God rescues us. God changes us. And so what you think feels like investigating God, and I'm, I'm looking into the things of God, that's actually God drawing you to himself. It's the process of God bringing you into salvation. That's what God does, and he's been doing it since the beginning of time. So we, can, we have a choice to make. And Paul's telling him, hey, Timothy, bro, build this thing on something that's not so fragile. Build your life, build your church upon the rock, the solid foundation of the gospel truth in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. That's where the power is. I'm not creative enough, nor do I desire to be. I actually feel zero compulsion to entertain you every week because I don't care. I love you, but I care about more about Jesus and being faithful to his word. And I think you're developing that appetite over almost five years now of you caring more about that than being entertained too. What happened? Our appetite changed. That's good news because that's what Jesus does. So we all come in with these really weird, diverse appetites. And then what he does is once you start eating the word of God, feasting on that, what does he do? He changes your appetite. And so you start to hunger, which sounds a lot like Jesus, hunger and thirst for righteousness. You want to do what he asks you to do. You want to be holy as he is holy. You're never going to be holy until you see him face to face in heaven. But the pursuit of that, your heart leans toward that. You, you, You look at your old life and you're like, that is dumb. That was so much bondage. That was so much baggage. Like that was, I was so weighted down. And now because Jesus has changed my appetites, I hate that sin. I hate that struggle. I don't want that at all. Like I literally let that go and I choose Christ. Boy, that appetite tastes good, doesn't it? That life is what we're after. And he's saying, guess what? That church who builds their church on that, guess what? That church lasts forever. Hey, your timer's going off, but mine's not going off yet. (laughs) I'm just messing around. But I did wrap up point number one, so that was apropos. (laughs) All right, point number two, the message declared. So you have the message delivered Paul's been pretty clear. Now the message declared. Paul being so moved by the, this powerful truth that the church is built on, what it's built on, he rattles off, listen to this, he rattles off with insane brevity. Like it's, it's this packs a hard punch, but it's, it's, it's quick. And you're, I, you can't fathom what he's saying here. He does it in a unique model. What he does, now just let me nerd out for just a second. What he does is he gives you three couplets, essentially. There are three little, uh, like three two-sentence statements, okay? And what that does is the way in which it's written, uh, really scholars believe that this was either like an ancient hymn 
or it's one of the first church creeds that were ever written. What is a creed? A creed is a theology and doctrine that the church rallies around. And it's to remind ourselves, yeah, that's good. We believe that. We've built our lives on that. And so right now, what we're going to study is Paul basically reciting to us either like a first century worship song or it's an ancient creed. And the reason they believe that is because every single line is literally grammatically structured the same identical. Now you don't see it necessarily in the English, but like the, the, the weight is on the structure of it. So what you're going to see is a comparison contrasts of the spirit world and the natural world. You're going to see the, the flesh and the spirit. You're going to see heaven and earth. You're going to see this, this comparison and contrast happen, but really it all gets its start right here. And you can, you can kind of feel it at the beginning of verse 16. He says, great indeed, we confess is the mystery of godliness. Like that, I don't know if he meant to rhyme it, but it rhymes. Essentially what Paul's saying is, he, he's literally saying, guys, what I'm about to tell you is so true. So true. You can count on it. And the mystery of godliness is something we've already seen. We saw it back in verse nine. They must hold the mystery of the faith. Then right here, he calls it the mystery of godliness. What is that? Just put it in your Bible right by that. Just put heart. It's the heart of Christianity. The heart of what makes you and me Christian, the heart of what makes any person Christian is, a, is what he's about to throw down right here. It's the essence of what it means to follow Christ. The message declared. What is declared first? Jesus revealed. Like this is so paramount. This feels basic, but if you're new, if you've never been saved, then this is not, like, this is going to be mind bending to you. Notice what it says in the very first phrase of your copy of God's word. He, that is Jesus. And it's not just capitalized because it's the beginning of a sentence. It's he because it's Christ, the anointed one, Jesus Christ, was manifested. Everybody say manifested. He was manifested in the flesh. Well, what does that mean? Jesus was God, is God, and man at the same time. Jesus is God and man at the same time. Where do we understand this reality? John chapter one, we'll put it on the screen for you. John chapter one, Jesus, here's what John's word says. In the beginning was the word. Now that word, word is logos, means the living word. Now it's capitalized, why? Because the word isn't this. The word is a person and that word is Jesus Christ. The word was with God. Obviously now you're noticing it's not a book, it's a person. The word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. Now what John is doing here is he's giving you a connection back to the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, we learn that God wanted to be with his people, right? And what was the symbol of God being with his people in the wilderness? Anybody remember? It's the tabernacle. He built a tent in the wilderness where his glory would come down and they would see the glory, the fire at night, the cloud by day. They would see the glory rest upon the tabernacle. And when the glory cloud left, guess what? They said, we gotta go too because God's on the move and we're following God wherever he goes. And so the tabernacle was the tent where God's presence fell. That word dwelt is the word tabernacle. And it means that Jesus pitched his tent with us and God's glory fell on Jesus and he is now God in the flesh. If you ever wanna know what God looks like, all you gotta do is look at the living word of God through the word of God and you see Jesus and you'll know what God looks like. This is the, the scholarly word, the, the incarnation of Jesus where God became flesh, put on skin, zipped it up and came here at Christmas through a little baby. And what did he do? Why did he do that? Hebrews 2 tells us why he did what he did. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. You see, Jesus did what he did, left heaven, came to earth, 
lived a perfect life so that he could pay for your sin on the cross. That, that he became the payment. He became the propitiation. He became the reasonable sacrifice. In the Old Testament, there used to be a priest who would be the person who would, uh, who would, who would go before God, like Moses, on behalf of the people. People, come tell me everything. I'll go run over here into this tent. I'll talk to God. I'll get a message from God. Then I'll run back over here, and I'll bring you this word on that situation. Then what Hebrews teaches us is this. You don't need the priest anymore. You have a great high priest. Who is it? It is Jesus, and he is the merciful, faithful servant of God on your behalf for you. And he took on the payment for sin and for your struggle and for, your, uh, for um, the mess that you create in your life. And he absorbed the payment for that on the cross. Jesus was revealed in the flesh, but he was also revealed by the spirit. Notice the next part. It says vindicated, by the Spirit. Everybody say vindicated. I don't know. When was the last time you used that word? Probably never. Vindicated. Here's what it means. Romans 1.4 says, and he was shown, there's the idea of revealed, to be the Son of God. So his actions pre-cross definitely validated that he was divine. Definitely. But the epitome of it was really the cross because everybody dies, right? Newsflash, didn't know if you knew that. Breaking news, everybody dies. But notice what he says. He was shown to be the son of God when he was raised by the dead, from the dead, not by the dead, that's weird. When he was raised from the dead by the power of the spirit, he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what validated his uh, being fully God and fully man, yes, the miracles, that was proof of, hey, new day, something's happening, what's going on? And then the greatest of all things was the dividing line of human history, was the death of Jesus on the cross, and then, oh, newsflash, breaking news, I'm alive again, resurrection. Oh, now, why, why does this, like, I know this is weird, not weird, but I know it's hard to understand, but um, I want you to picture it like this. When you're driving uh, like out west, n n not really here, but when you're driving out west, you, roads are flat unless you're in the Rocky Mountains. And when you're driving, um, you can like see the road and then like there's a, a horizon line and then you see the sky. So the horizon line is the differentiator between really the sky and the earth because you can see it right out there, Right? Jesus Christ is the differentiation between heaven meeting earth. He was the differentiation. He is the horizon line for human history where he is not exactly like you. He is exactly like God and comes like us. And he is the, the resurrection is the differentiating factor that he's not like every other man. He's sinless and perfect and he rose for you by the power of the spirit. Now here's what's so cool. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that lives in every Christian. And so what that means is that you, now don't make this say what I'm not saying. So just hear me carefully. So you, in the spirit, can be a horizon line where heaven and earth meet by the way that you live. Because your actions matter. Because what will they do? They'll either attract or they'll distract. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Jesus is revealed in the flesh and by the Spirit. So the Spirit is the power. The Spirit is what raised him from the dead. It's the power of the Spirit is what raises you from your spiritual death to spiritual life. Jesus recognized, notice this, he was recognized divinely. Notice what it says, is seen by angels, verse 16. Now stop and think about what he's saying right here. Seen by angels. What did these angels see? Four things specifically. First, they saw his birth. Luke 2 says this, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Who? The shepherds in the fields watching the sheep. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, the angels, and I think it probably was a little proxy glory down on the ground. There was just so much to take in. Why do we know that? Because it says they were filled with great fear. 
So as the angels show up in the sky, they, they had already seen the good news of this little baby in a manger and what he was going to bring to the world. He was going to take a chaotic world and bring peace. He would be the prince of peace, Isaiah says. He has an everlasting kingdom that has no end. I mean, this is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the immortal God born in the flesh for you so that he could save you from your sins. And the angels had already seen the end. They already know. And they're like, listen, this is the greatest news ever. And as soon as they said, hey, he's here, all of heaven, the choir of heaven shows up and they start singing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. They saw it already. They saw the baby in the manger and saw the cross and the empty tomb already. They also saw his temptation. Matthew 4, 11, Jesus was going through the onslaught of temptation from Satan. And at the end of that, the Bible tells us Satan leaves. Matthew 4, verse 11, angels came and were ministering. They saw Jesus in the midst of enduring every temptation that every human ever faces. And he was victorious over that temptation. Now, it tells us the angels saw that. And they made a beeline to Jesus in the wilderness and ministered to him. What did they do? I don't know. Maybe he brought him a ham and cheese sandwich because he hadn't eaten for 40 days. All, in, all we know is that it tells us in Luke's gospel that he came out of the Eremos, the wilderness, strengthened by the Spirit. They saw him in his stress. Luke twenty two forty three 43 tells us that uh, the cross was only hours away. His body was enduring, uh, um, I mean, even like modern doctors, you can go on YouTube and see some of this stuff. It's pretty insane what Jesus was, he knew he was facing the cross. He knew that really it wasn't just the pain of the cross that really tweaked his body. What it was, was the reality that he would become the payment for sin and that God's wrath would be poured out upon him for the sins of the world. And that is what put his body in agony and he sweat drops of blood. And it was there in that moment that the angels saw that. His three closest disciples couldn't stay awake. But the angels, heaven saw it. And notice what it says at the end, verse 43. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. They saw it. The greatest thing they saw was the resurrection. They've been waiting for, they've been waiting since Genesis 3 for the resurrection to happen. That's a long time, friend. Some of us are like, man, I've been waiting a week for God to bring me a breakthrough. Wait a couple thousand years and see how that works. And he's like, the angels, like that's the first thing that kind of shows up on the scene. You get an earthquake and then boom, angel shows up. Matthew 28, verse two and verse five through seven, it says, suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone. The only qualified person to roll that stone away was a heavenly creature. Heavenly creature shows up and rolls the stone and then he sat on it, which I love. It's like, this was easy. This is so easy for me. And then the angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid. See, every time an angel shows up, other than Jesus, they're afraid. Jesus is never afraid. And then the angel shows up and these women are freaking out. I know you're here looking for Jesus who is crucified. Greatest news ever, he is not here. He isn't here. You came looking for the dead, but guess what? He's alive. He is alive. He is risen from the dead just as he said it would happen. I know you haven't been listening for three years, but he's been saying it for a long time. He told you that he was gonna die. He told you that he would raise. And he also told you he'd see you in Galilee when this whole thing was over. You should have already made it there. But go ahead and come and take a look just, so you, just in case. Just in case, I want you to just go see where he laid his body. Just look at it, it's empty. Come and see where his body was laying and now go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I've told you. This is really important because what's happening here is the, uh, the apostle Paul is saying, what I need you to understand is what the, what, what, <laughs> what the angels witnessed, this was di divinely witnessed. This was, this was planned in heaven and seen in heaven and the angels have seen this whole thing play out. But what's powerful is it wasn't just seen in the spirit realm. 
It wasn't just seen divinely. Notice this, it was seen diversely. It was seen in action. It was seen on the ground. It wasn't just in the heavens. It wasn't just by these angelic beings. The resurrection of Christ was witnessed by people. Notice the very next thing it says. Proclaimed, it means preached in verse 16, to the nations. Do you see the the spirit realm and the natural realm compared and contrasted right there? Seen by angels, spirit realm. Proclaimed to the nations, natural realm. Comparison and contrast in there. Paul reminds these, these people in Ephesus of the diversity of the family of God. What do we mean by diversity? Proclaimed means preached, delivered to the nations. That word nations in the original text means ethnos, which is where we get our English word ethnicity. The apostle Paul is saying, hey, guess what? Heaven saw this. This little pocket of Jerusalem saw this and all the Jews didn't believe it. So guess what happened? This thing went to all the nations and all the people groups and every single ethnicity in this world. Literally, they're saying the foot of the cross is level playing field. All sinners, all in need of God's grace and forgiveness. And you come by grace and through faith on the person and the work of Jesus Christ, period, done. And he reminds them of this in Ephesians chapter two. He says, remember that you were at the same time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, I came to the Jews first, as in Jesus. And guess what they did? I ain't got time for that. I don't, I don't wanna be around that. I, I, we don't believe. Matter of fact, Jews don't believe today, still. And it's Jesus as the Messiah. And so what did God do? He opened a door of opportunity into the Gentile world, which is who? Every single other person on the planet. And he goes, you were strangers. You were on the outside. You didn't understand the the whole Levitical law and the power of of what God was doing in the book of Exodus, what he was doing in the book of Leviticus, what he was doing in Deuteronomy again, telling the law a second time. Why did he have to do that? you 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 don't get all that. But what you do get is this. Notice what he says. Having no hope, that's where you are on the outside without God in the world. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, not in the covenants, not in all those other, not in just Israel, it's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. You who were once far off have been brought near by the, by the blood of Christ. That's it. You've been brought near by the, by the blood of Christ. This is the picture What he's saying is that Jesus was recognized in the supernatural realm, but he was recognized in the natural realm. And the the effectiveness of the message is how quickly it spreads. That's the testimony of gossip. Good gossip spreads fast. Am I wrong? No, because people want to know, right? Right? The effectiveness of a good message is how quickly it spreads and how far it goes. How far is the gospel message penetrated? I think you are a living and breathing example of the faithfulness and the power of a proclaimed message that was delivered to an ancient world in a Jewish context, but has now been faithfully preserved as the pillar and the buttress of truth delivered to you whenever God saved you. And now you're here today. Like so much of us kind of gloss over that. Like we, don't, we stop and like the wonder of that should leave us in awe. Jesus revealed, recognized, and received. The response to this divine diverse gospel was that it was believed on the world. It had a global impact. The response is belief. Scripture teaches us, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Belief is the evidence that you get it. I'm choosing to put my faith and trust in Jesus. You know what's awesome? Is the moment that you believed, it's the moment that you experienced change. You weren't who you were the moment of your belief. And then what happens is you get to live the testimony of the Apostle Paul that we've already studied. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. 
This is what happened to everyone who believed. And this is Paul's testimony. He says, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. Is anybody humble enough to say that that's your story today? That listen, like I might not have been a murderer like Paul was. I might not have been plotting against the church, but listen, my sin is what separated me from a holy God. If I was an eight-year-old when I got saved or I was an 18-year-old or I was 28 or 38 or 48 or whatever eight you're at today, the truth is, is it's your sin that separates you from a holy God. And we are the worst of all of them, which is good news for those of you that are here today and you're not saved. Because what that means is that you are not in company that doesn't understand where you're, not, where you're coming from. We know where you're coming from. We know what you're, we don't, might not know the specific struggle that you might face. We might not understand the weight that you're under and the, the consequences of the decisions that you've made in your life that have gotten you up into this point. But what we do know is the weight of sin, of guilt, and of shame. And here's the best part. What we know that you don't know yet, but I'm giving it to you right now, is the burden lifted. The moment that we repent of our sins and turn to faith in Jesus Christ and the shame is gone, the guilt is gone. The freedom is an invitation into the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus Christ. We experience him, and we are forever changed, and you can have that too. I am the worst of them all, but God. How many of you got a but God testimony? But God. You have no idea who I was, but God. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners. Meaning, if he can save me, he can save you too. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. If he can save us, he can save anyone. Nobody is too far gone. A lot of us view God like T-Rex. He's got little T-Rex arms. Man, can't really grab much. Can't really come reach me in my pit of despair. Can't come after me when I'm in this burden of circumstance. Like he can't do that. God is less like T-Rex and more like Inspector Gadget. Some of you that didn't grow up in the 80s didn't laugh. You have no clue what I'm talking about here. But Inspector Gadget had like go-go gadget arms and could reach infinite lengths. The Bible tells us that God's ear is not too deaf and his arms are not too short to reach us. And he literally left heaven to reach you. He gave up glory to reach you. That's what he did. He gave up glory to reach you, but the beauty of the gospel isn't just that he left glory to come reach you. He ascended back to glory is what the last part of that verse says. Is he ascended back to glory. It says he was taken up in glory. The son was raised in power and he ascended to his place of honor and authority at the right hand of the father. He's in glory today. He's in heaven today, right here and right now. And some would say, awesome. What does that mean for me? Well, I think you're in a really good position if you're a son or a daughter of the king who sits on a throne at the right hand of the father in the seat of authority. You have what First John tells us is an advocate. You have an advocate. Well, what's an advocate? One who pleads the case on behalf of another. One who steps in on behalf of another, who consoles, who encourages, who empowers. The scripture tells us that Jesus is your advocate on your behalf to God. He is literally praying things for you that you have no clue that you ought to be praying for. But he's doing it on your behalf. He's advocating for you on your behalf because that's what advocates do. They stand in your place. And the beauty of the gospel is that you now have an advocate. But here's the other part of this that is super sick and super awesome. Jesus is advocating for you and for me. But he's also saying, God, today, today is today the day. Is, is, what about tomorrow? What, what about the next day? What about the next day? 
Because when Jesus ascended into glory, it is a legit 100% fact that he will soon stand from the right side of the Father and a trumpet will sound, which I don't know what that's going to sound like, but apparently it sounds like a trumpet. And is it going to be a coronation? Is it going to be, I don't know what it'll be, but what will happen is it will blow loud and all of the earth will hear. And Jesus Christ will come as a king. He came as a servant before, but he will come as a conquering king. And he will meet his church. You'll see him face to face. And it's going to blow your mind. So much of the gospel is really just sold as a bill of goods for you to change now. But the beauty of the gospel isn't just that you change now. The beauty is you get Jesus in glory forever. So let me ask you this question. What kind of church do we want to be? Like, are we going to, do, do we want to be a church that is constantly changing based off of the appetites of people? That constantly brings this latest and greatest innovation, creativity. God, in, listen, God was the chief innovator, okay? There was no such thing as a world and he innovated and a world happened. So I'm not against those things. But what I am against is, are we going to be a people that are clinging tight to the message or clinging tight to a method? Like, think about that. Some of you came from churches like that. Who do we want to be? What kind of church do we want to be? I, I feel like if... Let me, let me just say this and just let me be your pastor for a second. I believe that the only sustainable ministry model is what is called an exposition, expositional ministry model. What do you mean? Well, if we do church in such a way that is about pleasing customers, that is not what I believe is a biblical model for ministry. Because I, I see the apostle Paul throwing down, call, I see Jesus, let me just go to Jesus. Forget Paul for a second. Jesus looking at the crowd and calling them brood of vipers. <laughs> uh, I, I, he's, saying, he's calling them out for their own hypocrisy. Whitewashed tombs. Hey, you got all this religious stuff down. You show up and it looks like legit. But your heart is far from me. If Jesus were to show up today, Jesus would not have flashy music, strobes, unbelievable opulent ministry models with unbelievable extension of wealth. He does own the cattle on a thousand hills. He didn't need it though. He just needs the simple message of the gospel truth declared to the heart of people and they get saved. I'm not against any of that stuff. I love that stuff, but he doesn't need it. He doesn't need it. So an expositional style of ministry says, I don't cater to a crowd and you shouldn't either. We don't cater to a congregation. You shouldn't want that either. Expositional means we pull out of the Bible the way we do church. And we let the Bible tell us who our leaders are. Let the Bible tell us what our doctrine is. Let the Bible tells us what we should or should not do. And when there's matters of gray that we can't fully under, comprehend or understand what, what, what is he saying there, that's where we have what we talked about last week. Freedom and non-essentials. But this, is, this, is what's gotta, this, this has to model, we have to model our church after this. And if we don't do that, and if you don't want that, Guess what? Two things can happen. Number one, you can leave and go to a church that caters to a customer and that's fine. Or I can leave. <laughs> and I don't plan on going anywhere. And I don't say that to be rude. I don't say that to be arrogant. Hear me say this. I want to do it the way Jesus wants us to do it. And you can be fully convinced in your conscience over here that catering to customers is the right way but I'm fully convinced in my conscience biblically that that's not the way we have to do it. 
okay? So who do we want to be? Who do you want to be? You want to build your life on something fragile? Or do you want to build your life on a rock-solid foundation? I want the rock-solid foundation. Anybody with me?